everybody. Um, thank you for joining the session today. Um, so what we're going to be doing is talking about what an artist statement is. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the basics of how to structure it. And I'm going to sort of give you some suggestions of what you can include in it. So I'll be going through some tips um, about what to include maybe and what to avoid and getting you to think about who might look at your statement and what makes a good statement. Um, some of this is kind of like my own experience of being an artist. I sort of worked as an artist for about 20 years. Um, I've also worked in academia um, and I've taught this session to students about, you know, personal statements and artist statements. Um, I just want to say there is no perfect statement or template for it. OK, so I really want you to think within looking at artist statements, it's really about yourself as an individual in this and celebrating that rather than trying to squeeze into something that's pre-existing, okay? I think the most successful artist statements really have the flavor of the artist in there. So I hope that, you know, every one of you will have very different statements that allow for your personality to appear. Um, so having said that, the purpose of the session is really to help you with the structure of it. So that all of the kind of interesting things that you wanna say about yourself kind of really shine through and, you know, that you can avoid some of the pitfalls um, let me just share my screen um, so that I can bring up my PowerPoint. So is everybody able to see that okay? Yeah, great. Um, so this is just an image of lots of artist statements um, and things that I've gathered throughout the years from different exhibitions I've been to. Um, so an artist statement really is one of the tools that we need um, in our toolbox and it's really telling people about us as artists and that is really our job to communicate that to others. Um, you know, if you think about it, you are the expert about your art practice and who you are as an artist. Um, and so really it's, you know, our job as artists to convey that to people, um, to our audience or our readers. So um, in the session today, um, what I'm going to cover are a number of things. We're gonna kind of break it into two um, sort of sections really. So we're gonna have, the first part is really gonna be looking at what the purpose of an artist statement is. We're gonna be thinking about what makes a good artist statement. Um, and we're just gonna look at kind of some of the essentials around that. Um, we're gonna have a sort of tea break um, midway through. Um, so you probably need to kind of get a bit of caffeine at that point because the second half of the session is a little bit longer and it's going to be talking more about you and your artist statement. So it's really going to focus on what you can think about. And then at the end of that, we're going to sort of summarise the session and I'll just hopefully signpost you to some resources that you can use. Um, during the session, if there's any questions you want to ask, that's absolutely fine. You can do that, as Hannah said, um, through the chat box or, you know, if you want to unmute yourself and actually do it verbally, that's absolutely fine. Um, we're also going to have time at the end of the session if you want to ask any questions or if you've got any comments, um, anything useful that you might want to share. Um, and I think just generally, I really want you to sort of feel comfortable in the session, you know, and not feel worried about asking anything or if you're unsure about information, you know, please do ask. And I really want you to think, you know, this is about you getting what you want from the session. And um, some of you might be really quite experienced artists and just want to refresh, you know, your thoughts about what an artist statement is. Um, others of you may be less um, experienced and, you know, I'm not quite sure about how to kind of approach it. Um, and, you know, all of us are kind of maybe going to be at different points and that's absolutely fine. Okay. So I'm going to just sort of like, just go back to the basics of what is an artist statement, because sometimes we're asked to provide a statement and we might not even know quite exactly what it is. Um, so I just gleaned... Um, this information here about what an artist statement is from ArtQuest, which is a useful website to look at. Um, so they say an artist statement is a short piece of writing about you and your work. Um, it should be succinct, um, it should capture the reader, and it should tell someone about you and your work. So if you just think about it as a kind of very short introduction about you and who you are as an artist, um, you know, you will have other kind of things that you can kind of be more um, expansive about um, that you can give people about your practice. But an artist statement is really just that little short introduction about you and just kind of get people interested in who you are. 
generally, um, you know, the actual word count for a kind of artist statement, I would recommend between two to 300 words. Um, you could maybe be less than that, but I think any more than that, and it gets a bit maybe unwieldy. And within that, you've got to kind of convey who you are as an artist and what you do. So you don't have a lot of kind of, you know, um, word count to play with that. So that's where the trick is really, because we have to think about how we can use that word count um, in a way that's going to be, you know, we can maximize our words. And one thing to be quite, um, which might be quite useful to think about is you've got to imagine perhaps the person reading it doesn't know anything about you. Um, maybe they've got a limited time to read your statement. They also may have um, a number of other artist statements that they're looking at at the same point. So if you think about it in that context, you know, your statements got to work quite hard um, and perhaps, you know, may need to kind of just capture that person. So as I said, you know, it's got to capture the reader. So we'll go on to the next slide. And I've just put something up here about who might read it because it's quite useful to think about who's going to be at the other end of this statement reading it. So you may be making a statement that you need to send off to different people, arts professionals, curators. It might be for opportunities that you're applying for. It might be say a residency or an exhibition. And I think it's very useful to think about the kind of person that you're appealing to um, for this particular opportunity and what that artist statement is going to support. So on the right hand side here, I've just brought up um, an opportunity that I found on um, Access Web recently. So this is a residency opportunity, which is for the Grisdale Forest in the Northwest of England. Um, it's a lovely opportunity um, and it's probably, you know, quite a, maybe gonna be quite an oversubscribed opportunity. So I think when you're looking at something like this, you've got to think about, you know, what kind of artists are they asking for? You know, what kind of, um, you know, um, residency is it going to be? You know, so here we can see that it's they're looking for somebody who's going to be more sculptural, um, somebody who's got an interest in landscape and natural sites. So really, in, if you were applying for this and you thought, yes, this is, you know, exactly fits me and it's a great opportunity for me, I'd love to apply for this then you need to think about how your statement's going to kind of be appropriate for that opportunity and how it's going to maybe just pick out some of those things. So another thing to think about is who's going to be looking at this. Um, so this opportunity has a number of people on a panel um, who are going to kind of be reviewing the um, applications. Um, so amongst those judges, we've got David Nash, who's quite a well-known sculptor. We've got Claire Burnett, who's president of the Royal Society for Sculptors. We've got Hazel Stone, who's an arts development manager. And we've got Naya Roberts, who's an artist and arts manager. So as an artist, it would be good for you to kind of know who these people are, just do a little bit of background information on them. And so within your statement, it's you've got to try and think about how it's going to kind of sit with those people. So there's people from quite a varied background there in the arts profession. Um, and you know, so you've got to kind of uh, put your statement together with that in mind. And also what might be useful, this might be a rolling kind of opportunity. So maybe they do this every year. Um, and sometimes you can look back at previous artists who've been successful in these residencies or opportunities and just, you know, go and have a look at what they've written and, you know, what sort of language they're using and how their statements kind of sit. Um, so that's a really useful thing to think about. So we'll go on to the next slide. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Um, so as well as it being something that you're gonna be putting out there, I also want you to think about it actually being quite useful for you as an artist. And I'm sort of suggesting it can be a reflective tool for you. So, you know, what I mean by that is that, you know, Every time you're, you know, kind of putting something out there as an opportunity, um, you're writing an artist statement for something, you're always updating your artist statement. And it's a very useful thing for you just to kind of um, reassess where you are as an artist. And it really gives you a sense of your own progression. And it can, I think it can just help track your, you know, where you are as an artist and what sort of things you're interested in. 
I know like for my own self, I probably started 20 years ago with a very different statement to my statement that I would have now. I'd probably be really embarrassed if I looked at my kind of statements I first made. And I think a lot of the things that I probably did, I made errors because I probably tried to mimic maybe some of the narratives that were out there and I didn't really have my own voice. And that's fine, you know, because I was an inexperienced artist. But, you know, it's quite nice Then I look at some of my previous statements and think, oh, yeah, OK, you know, I've actually moved and shifted and changed and I've become actually more interested in this area of my practice now. So I think just think about it as, you know, also being quite useful for you as individuals. So what makes a good artist statement? Um, so I'm going to just go through a few slides now just to give you sort of an idea about different things that you might want to think about, um, um, you know, things that you want to kind of look at in detail in your statements. So one of the key things um, is clarity of language. Um, so things you need to think about are, you know, just using plain English, avoiding over complicated language, and to be confident, but obviously not gushing about your work. Um, it's that very fine line between being assertive and confident and professional, but obviously, you know, thinking about how that comes across. So I think if we start with the first one about being using plain English, it's kind of a common myth sometimes, maybe that artists think they have to use complex words when talking about their work. Um, I think it just needs to be clear and comprehensible and, you don't necessarily want somebody having to kind of look at, you know, a dictionary for every sentence that you're putting in there. Um, so thinking about using overcomplicated language. So on the right of the um, slide here, you can see I've got some different phrases. The first one at the top, my work is superb. I just made that one up and as a bit of a sort of tongue in cheek thing. I know I'm, I doubt anyone's ever going to sort of say that <laughs> in this context, but you know, it doesn't really say very much about your work um, if this was your art, you know, if you were the artist here. Um, the second one in green and the one in the red. So the green that says it's a human line algorithm inducing me to, oops, inducing me, well, I can't see that now, <laughs> inducing mechanical and organic connotations. And the other one, I work with personifications of fluid notions. Um, those were actually um, real things that I took from, uh, oops, just here. those were actually real kind of um, phrases that I took from a statement. Um, and, you know, I think they're overcomplicated and they don't actually, I don't understand what exactly what they mean um, in context to the work. So I think it's worth just thinking about, you know, how you're using language. And obviously the, the words in the blue are, you know, lovely, beautiful, amazing, stupendous, magical, special. Again, they don't actually really say a lot. They're quite gushing words. So I think, you know, it's absolutely fine to talk about your work in a very positive way, but, you know, just think about, you know, the kinds of words that you might be using. It does take um, practice, you know, thinking about the language that you're going to be using. Um, and th I think it's just all about being interesting and engaging with what you're saying about your work. Oops. So um, the next thing really to think about, it kind of leads me into this idea of being authentic. Um, I think it's very important to be you, um, you know, really sort of like wanting to talk about what's unique about you and your work. Um, I've used an example here in the illustration of the Channel 4 drama that was on recently called It's a Sin, which um, is about a group of young men who come together in London in the 1980s through the AIDS epidemic. But what I really loved was that, you know, they had an opportunity to suddenly become who they wanted to be. Um, and sometimes it can be quite difficult to be authentic um, and to express that without fear of judgment. And we are quite vulnerable sometimes as artists, you know, um, we put ourselves out there in the public domain. Um, but I think in the long run, you know, being authentic about your work is really important. Um, and I think if there's authenticity in what you're saying in your statement, you know, people will get that and they'll understand that. 
So accuracy. So accuracy is important in a statement. Um, so you need to be clear and concise, keeping information, you know, sort of neat and tidy, really. Um, ensuring that important information such as dates and names are accurate and checking your spelling and grammar. And it, I might sort of sound a bit harsh to say it, um, particularly, you know, if you have dyslexia or you struggle with written English. Um, but if a statement can, um, has errors, it may come across to the reader as careless or inaccurate and that may undermine your um, profile. Um, if information is incorrect, for example, it might lead to somebody mistrusting the information presented to them. So as we know, trust is really a critical element of building relationships in the creative industries. Um, I think, you know, obviously, hopefully people won't make judgments like that, but it, it's very important, I think, to just make sure that what you put out there is accurate and doesn't have errors. Um, you could get somebody to check your work if you, you know, feel that you would benefit from that. And I'd always say that's a really good practice just to get, you know, somebody to read it and just make sure it's all OK. I think particularly if it's going to be on like a public facing sort of, you know, site or, you know, it's going to be out there in the domain, public domain. So, um, Keeping it simple is really useful to think about. Um, so avoiding overcomplicated language and concepts. Um, it's good to sort of avoid that sort of overcomplication with too many words, ideas or specialist language. Some people might not understand particular aspects of professional practice. Um, so, you know, you've got to think about who, as I said, is gonna be reading your kind of statements. Having said that, I am a great supporter of using our English language to its full potential, because we've got lots of amazing words to choose from. And, you know, we should be creative with that, but it's getting that balance really between it being sort of effective and succinct and, you know, telling people about us and our work. So use words wisely. Um, I've put that because it's really quite challenging the task of writing an artist statement because we do have that limited number of words to say. Um, so I always sort of think about using like really powerful words, words that do quite a lot of work. Um, so again, we avoid those things that don't really mean much like lovely, exciting, whatever. Um, and avoid vague and superfluous statements. So really just be direct about what you need to say about your work. Um, I would also suggest avoid too much information. So really just if you put about, you know, sometimes in our practices, we're working with lots of different projects or we might be working with lots of different materials and we need to just be, you know, sort of pick out what are the kind of most important things that we want to be thinking about that we are particularly wanting to talk about. Um, just to remind us of that, I've put this image of the Delia Smith Complete Cookery course published in 1982. Um, that's one of my most reliable cookbooks that I've got in my kitchen. Um, the recipes work and, you know, they don't overload you with unnecessary information. Um, cookbooks actually are a surprisingly useful resource to explore. Um, a former colleague of mine used to use the Elizabeth David cookbooks, who she was a, a cook writing in the 1950s about Mediterranean food. Um, and her writing is very evocative, but it's also very sensible. And she's got a very nice warm tone about her. So my friend Lee used to use her as an example in kind of how to think about writing and talking to people about your work. Um, so finally, um, we need to think about being objective about our work because we've kind of got to stand back a bit about how we're talking about our work. Um, so really it's kind of, I suppose, you know, just common sense to just avoid embellishing or over-exaggerating things about your work. I don't think, you know, I'm talking to an audience who's going to be doing that, but, you know, just erring on the side of caution um, so that, you know, you can highlight your achievements, but in a confident manner. Um, it does take time, you know, to, I suppose, confidently assert yourself. So it might be quite a useful exercise just if you wanted to ask somebody, you know, how to write your statement. Um, so if you wanted to perhaps do an exercise where you get somebody else to write your statement. So you get them to perhaps ask you questions 
um, and see how they might describe your work. Okay, so I just don't know if that seems like we've come quite quickly there, but um, we're going to kind of break for tea break now. Um, we're just going to sort of have about 15 minutes if that is okay for everybody. Um, and okay. we'll come back to the next part two, which is going to be really focusing a bit more on you and your artist statement. Okay, I hope the first part was okay and that, you know, there's a lot of information sometimes with these sort of things. So um, in the second section, um, we're going to be looking more closely at you and your statement. Okay, and the kinds of things that you want to include and you want to tell people about your work. Um, I'll get you to think about some keywords that you might use to describe your practice. Um, and we'll look at the practice through two areas of how you make and what you make work about. Um, I've got some examples of my own statements, um, which one which I've recently submitted for a festival, which um, I'm going to break down and hopefully that will give you a sense of how I approach a statement. Um, we'll also look at the example of Nigerian artist Otobong Nkanga and see how she talks about her work, which will be really interesting. Um, and I'm going to summarise at the end and then just signpost you to some other useful resources. And then we'll have an opportunity to just talk any, about anything um, that you want to, um, any questions um, and any sort of discussions that we want to kind of have then. Um, I did just put something in the chat box about some kind of powerful words. Um, so I'll also, you know, put something together that perhaps Hannah could send out. So, OK, um, I'm going to share my screen. So yes, um, on to the first slide. So um, one of the things that you, you know, need to think about in your kind of statement are these two areas of your practice, which are concept and ideas and process. Um, I've just got a couple of images here um, to sort of just give us a bit of a flavor of that. So on the left, we've got um, something to illustrate the idea of concept, which is, Susan Orworth, who's an artist who's worked with um, studies of the brain. Um, she used brain scans of patients at the Royal London Hospital and then translated that information into a series of drawings and etchings. And I kind of really like this idea because she's approaching something which is medical science um, that normally has its own very particular language, but she's demonstrating the idea of, you know, how visual language is gives it a totally different kind of, uh, kind of concept really. On the right hand side, we've got um, an example of process. So this is an artist maker who you may know called Ruth Asawa, who's an American artist. And she's like created specifically her own technique of weaving with wire. And she makes these incredible intricate sculptural works. So I just wanted to kind of flag up those two areas of practice. And on um, the slide, there is a very nice quote from her, which says, an artist is not special. An artist is an ordinary person who can take ordinary things and make them special. So that's a really kind of nice thing to sort of just think about. So let's just think about um, your concepts and ideas. Um, so some of the things you might want to consider um, as important information in your statement might revolve around concepts and ideas. So what you're interested in, what you focus on and how you show that through creative works of art might be really important. Um, some of you might, you know, be more concept and ideas led, um, whereas other people might be more about process. So we're going to look in a bit more detail in a minute about what the inspirations are behind your work and what the meanings perhaps are behind the type of work you do. And also like, it's quite an important question about why you are creative. Um, and then, as I said, you know, maybe process is actually the thing that drives your practice and is more kind of integral to what you do. Um, so you might wanna think about the particular materials and techniques you like to work with, um, what sort of scale your work is, whether you're working in 2D and 3D or maybe your work's more digitally based. And it might be interesting to think about, are you working from a studio or do you actually like to work in a much more site specific way? Um, so let's just go on to thinking about 
what do I include in my artist statement? Um, so we've kind of got this knowledge about what a statement does, which we've talked about in the first part of the session. You know, what kind of language to incorporate? We might be thinking about who's reading it and how long it should be. But I think the kind of key questions really are what you want to include that is tailored to you as an artist. So ultimately, you know, you want to create a statement that's really going to tell someone about who you are or what you do as an artist. I think um, I've included this image here of Leonora Harrington's work, who is a surrealist artist, um, because, you know, she was very much against kind of like trying to sort of tell people about her work. You know, she sort of wanted to sort of talk about it being, you know, well, it doesn't need to kind of, you know, it shouldn't need to be kind of verbalised. And I think that's something, you know, it's a difficult balance really between well, ultimately we need to tell people about our work, um, but at the same time, you know, we want to like allow it to have its own visual language. Um, so I've got some series of things to think about here. Um, so let's start sort of thinking about, you know, ways that you can begin to articulate these things about your work. So at the top here, um, we've got, what are the key things you want to tell people about you and your artwork? So it's, I think that's really essential because you need to draw out those key things to ground you, um, sorry, to ground your reader, because they kind of initially need to be situated, you need to situate them um, and your work, um, sorry, you need to situate you and your work. So it's kind of like if, you know, you're meeting a stranger, as soon as you sort of start talking to that person, you find connections. Um, so it's really sort of like trying to kind of just sort of, I suppose, lay that sort of first thing down. And also, is there a common thread in your work? You know, it's good to maybe draw out some commonalities. I think like, for example, in my own work, I've got like some common themes of exploring things that are more intangible, um, more feelings in the air. And I've also been looking at things through a more female perspective in my work. And lately my sort of like process maybe is more performance led. So the second one is what's your story and why do you create? <clears throat> So it's worth thinking about the question of why you create, you know, what your starting point as an artist was and how that developed. Um, I think sometimes that can be quite difficult to unpack because often we're working instinctively as artists and, you know, maybe we haven't really had much time to think about that. Um, and I think it is a useful thing to think about because you can think about where has that creativity led you to. So, you know, thinking about your motivations for making work and the kinds of works that you've been drawn to make. Um, I think it's worth just spending a bit of time thinking about that. I was just looking recently on YouTube, there was an interesting video from a while ago about Louise Bourgeois' work, and she's very, you know, sort of uh, engaged in this idea of talking about, you know, her work was really coming from her kind of experiences of her family life and her history. So, you know, maybe there's something that's really driving your work, which would, you know, be quite interesting to tap into. So we go down to the third one there, what inspires you? I'm hoping this would be a really nice question for everybody to explore. Um, I think it's really useful to have in your mind because, you know, sometimes people will sort of say to you, you know, well, what is it that, you know, your work, what just, what inspires you about your work, you know, and what, what's kind of the inspiration for your work? And it's quite hard sometimes to just sometimes come out with something that's quite succinct for people. Um, so I think, you know, it's a good question to have in your mind. Um, we do have like obviously a natural connection and intuition in our work, but it might not be obvious always what inspires us. So I think we need to kind of understand what that feeling is that we kind of get connected to things with. Um, so in my own example, I um, went to the National Library of Wales a few years ago and I decided just randomly, I wanted to have a look at Gwen John's letters that were in there. And I'd never really sort of <clears throat> had a look at them before. Um, but when I sort of received them in the library, I was immediately sort of captivated and I knew they were really important for me to kind of pursue. Um, and I think since I've had time to reflect on that, um, you know, it became apparent that, you know, there were things in there that I really connected with as her as a female artist and the sort of struggles that she had um, and all sorts of interesting things about her life. So I think it's just, yeah, good to, for you to sort of like pull out some things that, you know, about what is inspiring you. Um, it might be useful for you just to spend a bit of time thinking about some of the projects or work you've done. Um, 
you might want to just, for example, use some headings for a few projects. And under those headings, just jot down some thoughts and feelings about what inspired you about those particular projects. Um, and hopefully you might see some kind of common things emerging from that. Um, it's almost like you've got to be a little bit of a detective looking at your work and sort of digging around to see what clues you can find. So um, if we go on to the next one, so what kinds of projects you've done um, that you've loved? What was special about them? So that's also quite a nice kind of thing about finding out what sparks your imagination and creativity and how did you choose to respond to those things? And I think often we're creating something very unique um, which hasn't maybe been made before, um, which is a really nice thing to think about. So, you know, just have a, perhaps a bit of thought about, you know, what it is that was special about things that you've worked on. And then finally, the types of materials and processes that you use. So again, you know, this might be something that's very important to you as a maker. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned with Risa Sawa, you know, you might be innovating with your own techniques or materials, and that would be really important to kind of, you know, say in your statements, um, you know, if that was central to your work. Um, you know, maybe your focus is on materiality and process, and, you know, that's, and it's less on concepts and ideas. Um, I think if that's the case, you want to sort of prioritise in like that sort of um, information in your artist statement and really talk about, you know, why you've selected particular materials to work with um, and their qualities. It might be good also to think about, you know, how these objects that you, you've made, you know, might get displayed or interacted or seen. Um, you know, are they large scale? Do they have a strong presence in a space? Or are you working on a really intimate scale? I think this is all kind of information that's quite useful sometimes if you want to kind of communicate what you're doing. So, um, on to the next slide. Oops. Um, so perhaps, you know, at some point you might want to just think about some of these things um, and start to jot down those things about you and your work, um, almost like just doing a little bit of homework to sort of think about what these elements are that are kind of really interesting for you and your work. If, you know, you might want to sort of just do a voice recording or, you know, just write some notes down. So, I mean, I suggest maybe that you just have a selection of images um, from projects that you've enjoyed or you might even have some kind of original artworks or materials and just lay those out in front of you um, and just really spend a bit of time just looking at them and absorbing them. You know, don't even sort of feel the need to actually write anything at that moment. Just, you know, spend a bit of time actually immersing yourself in your work because we don't often have that opportunity actually to do that. Um, and it is quite important just to have that reflective time. And then I think when you've spent a bit of time with it, just maybe you can start with some of those questions that you know I mentioned and just start writing down some of your thoughts and information and hopefully you know you might be surprised at what comes up um, maybe things that you hadn't considered before or thought about um, so it's sort of rather than kind of sitting down and thinking right I've got to write an artist statement now you know and that can be quite sort of like difficult if you kind of come at it from a slightly different angle sometimes that can be helpful so you're kind of it's more of an immersive process And um, so I'm just going to show you an example of a statement I've recently done. Um, and this is for a project which is um, part of a festival called Estuary Festival 2021. Um, so um, the project I'm presenting here is called Decoy um, and it's a site specific residency, which I'll be doing in May on the Thames Estuary. And it's exploring a historic decoy pond. And I'm working in partnership with a curator called Georgina Scott. So we both had to present our statements um, within the 150 word count. So I only had 75 words to play with, which was quite tricky, um, but also quite a useful kind of uh, exercise to do. And so for this statement here, I just really focused on um, this particular project. Um, so I'll just read through it. And then on the next slide, I'm going to break it down and just go through the statement bit by bit. Um, so Anna Falcini is an artist, researcher and writer who has long been fascinated with the Hoo Peninsula in North Kent. Intrigued by its unique atmosphere has led to Anna's PhD on the subject and the development of an archive of atmosphere, a collection of found objects from the peninsula that Falcini has identified as possessing atmosphere. 
As her alter ego, Louisa Cornford, Falcini performs the archive of atmosphere, reenacting the journeys of these North Kent marshes. So um, I just wanna kind of break this down a bit and just sort of talk about how I sort of structured it. Um, so the opening sentence um, is like a kind of marker in the ground and it kind of sets your reader in the picture. So here I introduce myself as an artist, researcher and writer. So for me, they're kind of three equal parts of my practice and, and they're kind of important for me for this particular residency that I'm doing. I think it's taken me quite a long time to um, be comfortable with who, what I say that I am. You know, I never used to say I was a researcher or writer. Um, even sometimes I used to struggle with saying that I was an artist. So um, I think, you know, you do kind of become more able to kind of feel comfortable in the kind of skin of the artist, if you like. Um, so I think like also I wanted to kind of talk about research and writing in this because I wanted to appeal to, an, you know, the audience in different ways. So after saying that, I then go on to say um, that I've been long fascinated with the Hoo Peninsula and North Kent. Um, I just wanted to kind of also just give that context of where the project's happening um, so that people understand, you know, where it's situated. So then I link um, that to my um, research. And so I sort of say, you know, I've been intrigued by this unique atmosphere and it's led to my PhD on the subject. And it's, I've kind of done that because I just wanted to let people know that it's kind of grounded in something that's bigger than the, you know, it's not just happening for this moment. It's kind of a continuation of something that I've already done. So that might be really useful for you that if you've already done a project, say you've maybe worked with an archive in mental health, you know, and there's a new project that's continuing on from that, you could reference something back, you know, that would be a connection. And then I talk about it's developed into this archive of atmosphere, which is a major body of work I've done. And I just explain that that is a collection of found objects from the peninsula. And I've identified them as possessing atmosphere. So I'm trying to give a kind of little bit of interest in what I'm doing and what I've done in the past in this landscape, um, but obviously within a very tight word count. And then I go on to sort of say how I've used that archive. So as this is referencing my performance work. So I've got this alter ego who's called Louisa Cornford, which I perform um, the archive of atmos atmosphere through. And I reenact these journeys in the North Kent marshes. Um, so I sort of just hint at this kind of um, element of my work through the performance um, and hopefully just give, you know, people just looking at the website, just a little bit of a view of what my work's about. Um, this is uh, another one which is a bit more substantial. So this was for um, a solo exhibition. Um, and I, I, I mean, it might be useful to go through it, but, you know, I won't sort of like um, spend too much time on it because, you know, there's quite a lot to get through and I don't want to sort of overload you with information. Um, but I sort of here just talk about, you know, my solo exhibition and what that was and then how I kind of worked um, so I'm sort of talking about what the kind of outcome of that was, which was a conversation between myself and the Welsh artist Gwen John. And I talk about, you know, what the culmination of this was, you know, five years of exploring this archival material. Um, and then talking about my process a bit of what happened with that. So I worked in film, drawing, photography and sound work. Um, and then I talk about the kind of institutions that I worked with and where the exhibition's being held. And then I give a bit more information about the project itself and some of the context of that project. And then finally, I talk about where that project kind of was located and just give a little kind of flourish at the end, I suppose, just to sort of uh, just bring it back to some kind of conclusion. Um, and then it was, a factual kind of thing that um, Gwen John had died 80 years previously in um, sort of uh, 1949. <laughs> so um, I'll go on to the next slide.
Um, so I just wanted to do a little bit of an exercise now um, with, with just, I'm going to ask you just to listen to this artist called Otto Bong and Kanka, and Kanga, sorry. And um, she really is very articulate about her work, um, but in a way that I feel is quite warm. And um, she has got a, quite an interesting practice because she's very eclectic. Um, we're only going to just listen maybe for the first three minutes about how she talks about her work. Um, and then what I'm going to do is just ask you to, you know, listen quite openly and then we're going to listen to it again for a second time and then just get you to note down any words or phrases that you know stood out to you or things that you found interesting um, and then we'll just kind of see what we discover through that. My name is Otto Bong Nkanga. I am an artist, a visual artist, also a performer. I'm interested that the work can talk about the body, can talk about the landscape, can talk about multiple ways of understanding how we can be here together. I remember when, as a kid, we lived in Yaba, in Lagos. We normally used to just walk to school. The sun would be coming up. The nice thing was that we'd see this, the roads glistering with mica on the ground. This is in the 80s with um, Diana Ross and the moment of glitter and glimmer. So I kind of imagine myself being one of these um, Bunyan ladies, which is weird, <laughs> and have the mica on the skin. It's something that is actually used in makeup. And I used to play with it and rub it on my skin, on a dark skin. It really glitters. It really comes out. And, and with the sun, you would play with it and flicker your hands from left to right and see it shine. It's not enough! It's not enough! I think the performative aspect of it has always been there. I think the performance allows for something much more physical that the drawings or let's say the sculptures does not allow. It's a different way of engaging with a public or with, um, when I talk about public, my public could be the sea, could be the mountain, could be the a people, could be a tree. And so the performance becomes crucial because you can really sense the emotion um, live. I wanted to erase the head because the head had too much information. We would look at the nose or your lips are too big or you're this and that. It would bring in that notion of maybe race. And it was just too much because I was like trying to make a drawing. And while trying to make that drawing, all these questions were coming up. And I was just like, okay, I just cut off the head. That was simple. Head out. Now, what I was interested in was gesture the action of doing, of making, of movement, really focusing on what we do and how we do things, how we work. And for me, that connection with the body rooted almost like a tree within a place was also to try to think of that the rootedness does not necessarily connect to geographically being in a place. So it's not about just your nationality, but it's about the land. And if we do not take care of that, then it will not be able to give us the things that we need. Okay, um, so I'll just wind it back to the beginning again, just we'll just go through that three minutes at the beginning of that uh, video again. Um, and just really pick out one or two things that you know, sort of, I guess, stand out to you um, in the way that she talks about her work. Um, and then we'll kind of come back and just talk about that. My name is Otto Bong Nkanga. I am an artist, a visual artist, also a performer. I'm interested that the work can talk about the body, can talk about the landscape, can talk about multiple ways of understanding how we can be here together. I remember when, as a kid, we lived in Yaba, in Lagos. We normally used to just walk to school. The sun would be coming up. The nice thing was that we'd see this, the roads glistering with mica on the ground. This is in the 80s with um, 
Diana Ross and the moment of glitter and glimmer. So I kind of imagine myself being one of these um, bunny and ladies, which is weird, <laughs> and have the mic on the skin. It's something that is actually used in makeup and I used to play with it and rub it on my skin, on a dark skin. It really glitters, it really comes out and, and with the sun you would play with it and flicker your hands from left to right and see it shine. I think the performative aspect of it has always been there. I think the performance allows for something much more physical that the drawings or let's say the sculptures does not allow. It's a different way of engaging with a public or with, um, when I talk about public, my public could be the sea, could be the mountain, could be the, the people, could be a tree. And so the performance becomes crucial because you can really sense the emotion um, live. I wanted to erase the head because the head had too much information. We would look at the nose or your lips are too big or you're this and that. It would bring in that notion of maybe race. And it was just too much because I was like trying to make a drawing. And while trying to make that drawing, all these questions were coming up. And I was just like, okay, I just cut off the head. That was simple. Head out. Now, what I was interested in was gesture. The action of doing, of making, of movement, really focusing on what we do and how we do things, how we work. And for me, that connection with the body rooted almost like a tree within a place was also to try to think of that the rootedness does not necessarily connect to geographically being in a place. So it's not about just your nationality, but it's about the land. And if we do not take care of that, then it will not be able to give us the things that we need. My name is Otto. Okay. So um, hopefully there were some interesting things that might have come out there for you. Um, I don't know, you could either perhaps put it in the chat or, um, you know, if you, anybody wants to kind of raise a hand or, you know, sort of do it verbally, that'd be great. Ashley's putting the together some words being put in the chat there, Anna. I don't know if you can see. Oh. Um, glitter, glimmer, shimmer. Oh, yeah, really. oh, thank you. Yeah, so glitter, glimmer, shimmer, and rootedness. I think these are all really lovely kind of words that she talks yeah, about her, you know, that really gives you a sense of her kind of um, the practice, really, and some really kind of um, creative words that she's using there. <clears throat> and that, yeah, the idea of performance um, is, you know, that's kind of obviously her process. Um, I really like the idea of rootedness as well when she talked about that and um, how she connected that to the landscape. And I mean, just things like she was talking about, like doing, making, movement, you know, very simple kind of words um, and how we do things, you know, but it was just, yeah, you know, I think articulated very well you know, things in her practice um, and how she talked about, you know, that sort of her materials that she was using, like, you know, the things that were glittering and shimmering. Okay, physicality of movement, sorry, sorry, physicality of performance, gesture, action of doing, making and movement. Thank you, Michelle. So linking to childhood. Yeah, I think that's, I love that idea of play that she talked about. Um, and we can all kind of relate to that. So it's, her work is very relatable, I think, in the way she talks about it. Um, absolutely right, you know, about how, and Jackie's also mentioned about play too. Great, that's really good. So I just think like, um, these are quite useful sometimes just to kind of, yeah, look at how artists talk about their work. So we've got some more comments here. The body rooted in the land from Marissa. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, how she talks about that connection with the landscape and how her body connects with the landscape 
or generally how people are connected is great. So we've got Kate saying ideas comes from her childhood and the material of the mica. Yeah, I think those are really nice things that she kind of has, like I was saying, you know, what inspires us? Why do we create? And, you know, she's taken that right back to memories of childhood, which are really lovely. Um, she's identified straight off as a visual artist and performer. Exactly. Um, yeah, so she's, yeah, I think asserting herself as an artist, um, as a visual artist and performer. Um, but yeah, just talking about that in a really interesting way. Multiple ways of understanding, removing heads as it's too much. <laughs> yeah, I really like the way she talked about that. You know, that would be something quite strong in her work that, you know, might sit well in an artist statement, you know, about how she raises the head. She really sort of was quite firm about that. Um, engaging the public, um, that could be the sea, tree, mountain. Diana Ross, 1980s, Sun on the Road, Not About a Place. Yeah, I think that, you know, there were lots of really nice things that were kind of contextual, which, you know, could cross over into different people's kind of experiences and life. So we could relate to those things. Yeah, definitely. I really love that idea that she took that, you know, I never realized when I sort of first looked at her work that she'd removed the heads for that reason, you know, that they were kind of too provocative maybe. Um, so really lovely comments. Thanks everybody. Mica on the black skin and how she used to move her hand in the sun. Yeah, that's the idea of, you know, the material kind of actually being performed on the skin is really nice, isn't it? A nice image to think about. Okay, that's great. Thank you for all your lovely comments there. My name is Otto Bong Sorry. from Canada. So um, we've kind of come to the end of the uh, session now. Um, so really just wanted to summarize um, everything we've talked about. Um, we've, got, we've covered a lot of ground there um, and hopefully some of those things you can take away and they will be useful for you. Um, so we talked about an artist statement being a short piece of writing about your work. Um, we talked about who your audience might be. Um, we've discussed the authenticity of that. Um, adapting it for different opportunities. So, you know, thinking about your artist statement always being flexible, really. So it doesn't have to be rigid, that you can adapt it for different things that you want to kind of use it for. Um, really importantly, highlighting, I hate this word, but USP as an artist. So highlighting your unique selling point. And what I mean by that is highlighting your individuality. Perhaps that's a nicer way of putting it. Um, and, you know, as I said before, you are the expert on your work. and you know, that's great. So you can talk about that to other people. Um, and, you know, you have a lot to kind of offer that's interesting to people. Um, and so it's about how you convey that. So just to finally finish off, um, just some areas that you might want to go to if you wanted to kind of like explore this further. Um, artist newsletter is a very useful resource if you've signed up for that. Um, they have lots of really good things on there about um, doing artist statements um, and all sorts of other things about, you know, information to, you know, help you support you as an artist. Um, ArtQuest is a very good website that I've used quite a lot. Um, that's got lots of good information on for artists. They do have specific resources on there about artist statements as well, which I've used myself. Um, social media is also a good place to look. Um, so here on the illustration on the slide, I've got um, one that I've just um, taken from um, a artist statement um, hashtag. And this is just a graphics team from Southport College who've put up like some really useful things about writing an artist statement. I just want to also mention that you just be a bit wary sometimes because not everything on social media is reliable or, you know, some of it I looked on there and I thought mm, I didn't really think that it was, you know, I, would, I wouldn't use some of the kind of tips that people had said. Um, so I think, I suppose, you know, things like Artist Newsletter, you can rely on those, they're very useful. 
Um, things like reading other artists' statements. So um, here I always myself pick up, whenever I go to an exhibition, <laughs> I pick up the information and take that back with me. Um, and it's always really useful to read those statements about other artists and how they're presenting themselves. So, and as I said, you know, you might want to look at opportunities and see if other people have been successful before, go back and have a look at their statements. Um, it's very good to look at international, national and regional galleries and how they um, are talking about artists and how artists are presenting themselves on those sites, particularly like, um, regional galleries or national galleries have a public remit very often. So I, for example, worked with the New Art Gallery in Walsall a few years ago, and I specifically was looking at how they kind of were communicating to their audience. And they really do have a very good way of being very inclusive and having to kind of think about how they kind of communicate ideas about artists across to audiences who are very varied and coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. So I think that is a really good place to look actually to you know, your regional galleries. If you are fortunate enough to be at a university, you could also tap into the university career service. Um, often you can like book one-to-ones with your careers person there, or you know, they might have really useful resources. Um, so thank you ever so much for listening and for coming to the session. And I hope that you found some things that are useful for you. Um, there are going to be some one-to-one -one sessions available. Um, so I'm sure Hannah would be able to kind of advise you on that. And I know that the um, PowerPoint will be available as a resource on Outside In. Um, and yeah, so we've got time for any questions or comments or if anybody's got anything they wanted to kind of say. I'll just come up my screen. Great, thank you so much.